Hello, Outfest family. I'm Mike Doherty. I'm the director of festival programming for Outfest. And thank you for joining us for this special panel discussion with the team behind Rurangi, um, airing exclusively on Hulu starting June 14th. I am joined by series writer Cole Mayers, um, series producer Craig Gainsborough, series director Max Curry, and series star Els Carrot. Woo! Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am so excited we're bringing this series to the out fronts and, and helping you highlight this wonderful story. So I want to talk a bit about the origins of this series and where the ideas came from. And if, uh, Craig, you could talk a little bit about the inception of this project. Uh, yeah, sure. So Rudangi actually started in a writer's room uh, with a whole you know big group of writers coming up with a whole lot of different ideas for, for series. And... Um, one of the writers, Oliver Page, uh, was tasked with um, building up uh, this concept. Uh, and we very early recognized, well, hold on a second, this is transgender story. It needs a transgender writer front and center. Uh, so Cole was brought on board quite like right there early on at the start to really take this project and run with it. Um, and that's kind of what he's done. So uh, pretty much everything we started off in the writer's room landed up getting thrown aside. Uh, as we went through this process of development and creating the story of Rurangi. Um, and that was a process of working with um, Oliver, uh, who's, who's the other writer on Rurangi, and Cole in a series of um, writers' rooms and workshops uh, over a number of months. Um, so, yeah, no, it was quite a lengthy development process um, and one where, you know, which was definitely had its challenges, right, Cole? I think you can talk a bit to that. Um, but but uh, quite a rewarding one in the end, Cole. Yeah, um, it was. It's interesting because it makes me sound really bossy. And um, <laughs> th throughout this whole Rurangi journey for me, you know, the multiple years that we've been working on it, it's really been a journey for me as well about building up confidence in my own work and and assertiveness about about what I want to see and what I don't want to see. Um, and so, yeah, starting from that very kind of original point, um, I'd just been through a series of interesting experiences where I'd been brought on board as consultant to various things and kind of my input had never been given any serious thought or consideration. And uh, so I came onto it being like, no, I'm going to be very clear about what I want to see and what I don't want to see. Um, if this is going to be something that I'm, you know, going to have creative control over um, because there are so many terrible trans stories out there. Um, and representation is such an incredible force for good, but it can be such an incredibly negative force as well. If you're seeing, you know, representations of yourself that, you know, are full of tragedy or full of trauma. Um, and so I, you know, I had this big list of things that I didn't want to see and and then things that I did want to see. I want to see real romance. Um, I want to see affection and intimacy and trans people being seen as, you know, lovable and sexy and desirable um, and not in that sort of fetishizing way that, you know, so often underpins how trans people are represented in, in relationships. Um, and I wanted to see the good stuff about being trans. Um, I wanted to see community and love and support um, because that's hugely what's, what I've experienced, um, but I've never seen it. Or well, I definitely didn't want it to be a transition story. Um, I've seen so many of them, they're all, they're really complicated to put on screen for so many reasons, including ethical reasons about casting. Um, but, you know, I think about my own life and I'm like, actually there's a lot of the time that I'm not thinking about being trans and I'm just being a person, you know, going to the supermarket and, you know, paying my library fines and dealing with technology crapping out on me and, you know, all of these things. It's, it's interesting. Like the way you talked about like the the dearth of trans stories that you've really responded to being out there, because um, I feel like especially in the states where we're still kind of in the infancy infancy or maybe early adolescence of seeing trans stories 
made by trans people um, mm. and seeing that representation on screen. And I was curious, like where Rurangi fits in the landscape of New Zealand cinema, television, in terms of how much trans representation do we see there? We only get so much here in the States from New Zealand. So I'm just curious if Rurangi is like a trailblazer in that genre or? I mean, there hasn't really been a lot of kind of trans people on in New Zealand's screen. The, the closest we've had is jo- Georgina Beyer in a film called Jules Dahl, and she was actually nominated for Best Actress, um, which was a big deal at the time because it was a trans um, Māori woman who has been nominated for Best Actress. But, um, yeah, Cole's right. Like, you know, th- since then there hasn't been something, certainly not of the scale in terms of the gender diverse people that are in front of the camera and the gender diverse people that are behind the camera and all the different departments. So in that way, you know, Rurangi has been quite groundbreaking here in New Zealand as well. Yeah. I mean, cause that was, that's always been a really important part about Rurangi as well, was it's not just what we were seeing on screen, but what was happening, you know, behind the camera and stuff as well. Who was, who had, power to make decisions, who had creative control, you know, who, who was, you know, being hired for various roles. Um, and so, you know, we had an internship program that was an important part as well um, for gender diverse people, a paid creative internship program. So that it wasn't just about, you know, in front of the camera and behind the camera, but it was also about, you know, who was going to be in front of the camera and behind the camera in the future, um, putting those seeds out there to, you know, give opportunities to trans people to, to upskill and to become part of the, the screen industry. Um, we also made sure that every single trans role uh, was cast with a trans actor. It was a, a, a non-negotiable part of, of the casting process. Um, and we also had a panel of trans experts who reviewed the progress at, I think, six or seven points throughout production um, and gave their feedback, but also were were empowered with the ability to say, no, stop, go back, fix this. Um, and that was something that, you know, like it was a veto, a veto power essentially. Um, because it, it's funny when you see some of the representation of trans people on screen and you go, this is multiple millions of dollars that have been put into this, this production or something like that. And you watch it as a trans person and sometimes you just feel like, sick to your stomach with how how could this possibly have got to this point when it's so incorrect or it's so damaging um and the message that you get from that as a as a gender diverse person watching those kind of things is you go no one like me at any point during this entire long process of making this thing and getting it on screen and getting it to cinemas or whatever, at no point during that whole process was anyone like me given any kind of power. You know, for better or worse, people often think of the director as kind of the author of a piece. Um, mm. And uh, of course, anybody who works in production knows like it takes a village to to make something. And I always wanted to talk to you about what was your collaborative process like with Cole and with this team and ensuring authenticity while you were, you were sitting in the director's chair. Uh. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I mean, the first kind of memory that comes to mind in terms of my collaboration with Cole and what it was like, Cole, is like me turning up at your house with my office chair, like in the back of my car, oh, yeah. and kind of carrying it in so that you and I could sit. And um, it was a real, it was a real kind of transformative point in our collaboration because, um, you know, Cole had started working on this before I came on board. That's always a moment in a production when there's a director and the writer kind of square off across the floor. And um, (laughs) that was, that was really about me sitting with Cole in his home and we were going like line by line, scene by scene. And I mean, 
Cole, you jump in here, but I felt like, you know, my, my job there was to listen. And the question was like, what are you trying to say here? Like what, how does that feel? You know, what is, what does that mean to you? Because, um, as a cisgender person, you know, when I first read the script, there was a whole lot of really beautiful kind of, um, language and authorship there that speaks volumes to the trans audience that I was not picking up on because of, you know, my lived experience. And those are things that have made it through, um, you know, through this collaboration with Cole, like the way that we handled the dead naming, like the way that we had, um, anti-trans kind of graffiti and never saw it. You know, we play that off reactions. So there's just all these kind of like, um, you know, parts of Rurangi that make it, you know, what it is um, that, you know, on my first read of the script, I wasn't getting. So sitting down with Cole for like a month um, and kind of going really slowly. And I feel like for me and my process, that was in a way like the first time I was really starting to walk in Cole's shoes. And a lot of that was also being like in his home, drinking his tea. Like, you know, that was where we got to know you each other. You didn't bring your own snacks though. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring our own snacks, yeah. So, so, so in terms of that, um, yeah, very close. I mean, it has to be that, that way because Cole is like, you know, the authentic trans voice at the heart of Rulangi. So um, probably a lot more than maybe the case on other shows as series director, I really needed to kind of look through his eyes and, and, and consult kind of throughout. It is kind of the elephant in the room. You know, we say about Rulangi that it is uh, crewed by, co-produced by, um, uh, written by, you know, starring trans talent. And yet in terms of where we are in the industry at the moment, although Craig looked, you know, really hard for a trans director and hearing myself say that I hear this said so often about trans actors. Oh, we looked, we couldn't find any. Um, so, you know, we had to settle at this stage for a, a, a salty old homosexual, but um, we, we, you know, Craig made sure that that was we were creating the solution to this problem by having, you know, a director internship. And if we look ahead to fingers crossed, you know, season two, um, you know, those those opportunities are multiplying in terms of you know getting uh, trans. Uh, director interns and trans directors you know, into the series as well. Whenever I think about this question, I think you know, I couldn't ask for a better partner in this process than Max as far as as far as that goes because you know it was like what you said that the first thing that you that you felt that you needed to do was listen and it sounds simple but so often that's not the case um and I actually I really enjoyed that time that we spent together but Els, I want to hear from your perspective, your journey to this role and, and when you came on board and what connected you to the character. Um, well, I came on, I, I, I mean, I've, I've not been in the game for very long. I think I, when I met everyone, I'd been acting or, you know, doing classes, um, you know, just a few auditions, I think maybe a year into it. <laughs> And anyway, um, my agent sent me the brief and, you know, the sides and I had a read and it was just like instant connection. It was so relatable. I was like, this is my life, but not like it was very different, but it was like, there's so many aspects of it, you know, like um, Kaz and I both coming from a rural small town, you know, um, moving to the city, um, you know, when I left my hometown, I was, you know, so um, referred to she as, 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 you know, as a, as a girl. And when I came here, it was a, it was a, it was a way to sort of um, claim who I really was, which was not a girl and not she and ours and I'm, I'm a man and, and this is me. And, and um, I guess that was the beginning of my transition maybe, um, and yeah, just a chance to 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 re restart, I think, um, and just own my own own myself. Um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, this was your first on screen role, correct? Yeah. The the role for your first on screen role, it's something that required a lot of intensity, a lot of uh, a tough yeah. moments. And I'm just curious if there were challenges in in crafting this character for you. 
Um, I think the biggest challenge for me was really um, the difference between Casno is that he's, he's an activist. Um, you know, I think growing up in a small town for me personally, I, I felt like I was the only transgender person there. I mean, before Rudang, I'd never even met another transgender person. Well, I probably have, but I never have had a conversation with another trans person. And, and so I had to then, um, you know, discover this new world of act- activism and, and, and then all of a sudden be surrounded by all these different, you know, these this diverse crew and, and that was all really new for me and, and, and not something that was a part of my world. So um, I think that was the biggest challenge. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the setting, the main rural setting of Rurangi. Um, uh, it was such an interesting choice to me, this like this politically charged, like farmland environment. And uh, I, I just loved the the setting and the creation of that on screen. Could we, I'm not sure who best to speak to this this choice of location, but if we could talk a little bit about where that choice came from. Yeah, where, where did the, like when I came on board the project, it was, it was already very much about rural New Zealand. I feel like there was sort of the grains of the Georgina Bayer story, you know, um, the being the mayor of Carterton, which you know, is, is like, I think one of the world's first trans, you know, indigenous um, woman who stood for, for sort of uh, the mayoralty and a very conservative um, part of New Zealand, a real farming town. There was sort of a, a bit of that DNA in the start of this idea. And then I think, I mean, I know Cole, in terms of your activism, uh, you know, that there was, there was sort of interesting political stuff there for you to sink your teeth into as well. And Craig's environmentalism. So I feel like, you know, it was a, a little bit of everything. And me coming from a small uh, rural town in New Zealand called Palmerston North. Um, so a bit of all of us, I think. It's also, it's also a pretty common story and yet it isn't one that we see. Um, Mm. You know, the number of trans people that I know that come from small towns that came to a big city in order to kind of find a space to be themselves or to find a community or, um, or to get away from, from something specifically. Um, And so, you know, giving, giving those people a chance to see that aspect of their lives on screen as well was, was a really exciting thing as well. And that's actually feedback that uh, kind of surprised me. I had this one experience after a screening um, that I was doing a Q and a at where someone came up to me and they were like, Oh my God, I just cried. I cried and cried the whole time. And I was like, Oh, you know, what was the most emotional part for you? And they were like, it was seeing all these, all these scenes like rural scenes that just felt so like my home. Um, and that, you know, most people say, Oh, you know, it's the the stuff with the dead or it's the, you know, um, such and such, no spoilers, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the strength of the emotional response to, to people, trans people from rural spaces, you know, getting a chance to see that on screen was really, yeah, moving to me. Yeah, and something I wanted to talk about, like um, just the wonderful ensemble in the in this series that like, there's so many story threads that begin that make me really excited for where the show might go in a season two. Um, oh, good. One, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, well, one character yeah. I really <laughs> loved was, and forgive me for pronunciations, Anahara. Um, yeah. who the, the show does a really great job, especially for someone from the US who might not culturally, you know, know too much about what's going on in New Zealand. But her arc of, you know, feeling insecure about how closely she has adhered to her Maori identity and like learning the language later in life. Um, and at one point, uh, another character calls her a plastic Maori, I believe it is. And I'm just wondering if we could talk a little bit more about um, that story thread, because I feel like especially viewers in the States might might love a little more context for, for that journey she's going through. There's a line from another character um, who says, um, first we were supposed to feel shame for speaking our language, and now we're supposed to feel shame for not speaking it. Um, and who benefits from our shame um, and, you know, I, I feel like that is, that is quite a widespread kind of 
narrative for indigenous people was this idea of like first trying to er eradicate that that aspect of of people or or of yourselves of this idea that you're supposed to assimilate um but then now this idea that you're supposed to somehow have all that um you know cultural knowledge and and cultural pride and stuff like that and and like you know who's who's benefiting from making you feel less than when cole sort of talks about how he sees and experiences the world um yeah as a as a trans activist a lot of it in some way is kind of an interrogation of power and you know i think that's what one of the wonderful things about rurangi and the trans gaze at the center of it is that like that's not limited just to like trans stories right this kind of interrogation of power and how people are disadvantaged um you know is so much broader and you know we're new zealanders the story is set in new zealand rurangi is about healing of people you know the land and relationships and so, you know, there's this like wonderful opportunity to explore um, themes of healing and self-acceptance, um, you know, in a far, far broader context. And so, you know, that character of Anahera and her journey, um, you know, in, in terms of kind of standing up and claiming her identity, which you're, you know, you've seen it, Mike, you know, that that happens in a very powerful way. Um, yeah, it just resonates, I think, really strongly with the perspective that's at the heart of Rurangi. Um, yeah. That claiming of identity really applies to the, the, you know, the three, the circle of three friends that kind of form throughout the series. And I want to talk to Ellis about kind of forming, like working with those two actors, um, I'm going to try, Alina Rose Ashby and Arlo Green, um, yeah. to form kind of that chosen family. And, and what was the process like working with them and, and getting to know them? So one of the rehearsals that we, we did, um, we it was Jim's birthday and Max had asked Kaz and other had to come up with a song to sing for for Jim, um, had birth. It was song. really rude. It turned out like that Kaz and, and Anahera are, have, are, are quite rude and naughty. Yeah, yeah, yeah they are, they are. Um, and yeah, we, we sang it to him without him knowing and <clears throat> gave him a little birthday card that said, you know, had birthday and that we loved him. And um, yeah, that was really cool. It was really fun. And what else did we do? Um, I'm going to go skateboarding, the three of you, which had like mixed mixed results. Yeah, we tried. We tried to. I had the dud skateboard though. I'm just not that out there. My wheel was but broken. Um, I feel like the three of you really like jumped, really jumped into that opportunity to kind of get to know each other in character. I was going home after those sessions together, so excited and joyful because I could see like the three of you really starting to cook. And I mean, remember all the weird stuff that Arlo, Arlo can just like run his mouth and, um, and was coming up with all this crazy stuff that happened like in the classroom. And actually, and this kind of segues into you, Cole, because um, a lot of the stuff that Arlo was coming up with you know, and these, these improv exercises, his backstory, then started to filter into the script. And because he came up with this idea that he loved to run as a kid and he'd run barefoot. And so his nickname was Flash. And then when we had that scene in the caravan, there was like a song that was about his feet. And so I just, I love the way that, I guess in terms of the structure that Craig built around us and the, the way that he empowered us as creators and trusted us, gave us a lot of, bandwidth and opportunity to see what emerged out of our actors sort of i got to carry that to cole cole wove it into the script and um yeah. it was just a really satisfying way to way to work and i think it just allowed arlo and afina and owls you know when we're actually there on set Owls, i would say the direction to you would be things like remember the po number or just little things like that right that you know, we're, we're based on an exercise that we did like ages ago and it would just shift your performance in really interesting ways. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful for, for the three of you and the way that you just loved one another and trusted one another. And um, you know, it's definitely going forward. I'm just so invested in, in that, um, that little family within the show. I just love it. I'm really grateful to, you know, as my first, first, first time in, front of the camera and on a set to be surrounded by those powerhouses, you know, Arlo and, and, and Afina. And also, you know, I, I really want to thank you, Cole, for allowing us to have that creative freedom 
um, to bring our best work. And, you know, by the sounds of it, you don't always get that. So, um, you know, I just really appreciate that. Um, thank you. Yeah, well, I think it's that, I mean, and that's why what's on screen kind of has translated to being really fresh and feeling really alive and authentic and stuff like that is because, you know, none of us were stuck in these ideas, you know, traditional ideas of hierarchies and, and um, power relationships where, you know, like as a writer, I know that, you know, my job is, is kind of holding all of these things together and holding the heart of, of where we're going and things like that. And, you know, but I don't know the, the depths and the insides of, of Kaz to the extent that the actor does. And so, you know, stuff that comes from, comes from the actors in the moment and in the, you know, being deeply steeped in, in knowing these characters and stuff like that, that, that is wonderful stuff for in a script. Um, I remember one conversation, um, <laughs> me and, and Arlo, you know, he's like, I need some, give me something random facts for, for Jim to say that he hates or whatever like that. And this is just, you know, in the moment. And I'm just, I don't know, it's something that really annoys me is blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, it just, he said it and it fitted so perfectly with, with, um, the Was moment. that live action? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I love that. You know, you know, I think lots of random stuff like, you know, um, what's up with lime flavored milk? Um, uh, <laughs> which is actually bad. like a legitimate thing for me. I'm like, lime flavored milk, why is it a thing? Like, that's a disgusting flavor combination. Is that a thing? I, I remember. Yeah, exactly. It's like, who puts citrus with the dairy products? Like, uh, <laughs> everyone knows that's going to be a bad time. <laughs> I actually like lime milkshakes. Oh, get out of here. You're fired. <laughs> Al, moment of truth. Moment of truth from Al's. Oh, no. Yeah. Craig, what, where are you on the lime milkshake scale? Uh, I, I think I definitely agree with Cole on this one. Sorry, Al's. Yep. <laughs> I can't even conceive of those flavors going together. So it's... Uh, it's um, Right? <laughs> I, may not, I may not partake. Um, Come to a New Zealand, Mike. It's a national shame. It's a national shame. Somehow they did not... They gave me Marmite when I was in New Zealand, but not a uh, lime milkshake. Um, but Craig, I wanted to bring it back to you because I'm hearing a lot about the working together on set and the love and the collaboration. And there was something interesting in your bio when I read it. The first line is, Craig is devoted to ethically reimagining film and television production. And um, mm -hmm. I wanted to hear from your perspective what that meant for you in terms of Urangi. That's a big question, Mike. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, all your ethics, Craig. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think as, you know, if, if we look at Rurangi's journey, you know, like, and I, th I think you kind of heard it just from the very start, like it's it's been a tough project to put together. You know, it's been a really challenging project. You know, there's, you know, re representation and, and supporting a community is, is about power sharing and enabling voice. And so that's been really at the core of what we've been doing from the very start. Um, and a lot of, I guess, the kind of traditional models operate on a, on a, on a, in a way that is kind of counter to that. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a challenge from the very start. And, you know, we've, we've been fighting as a team, which, is, which has been awesome because we, I feel like we're such a strong team, you know, like the, the three of us and then extending that out to our incredible talent and uh, Tweety YTT, who's another co-producer. Um, Tweety came on board to, um, to, to basically look after all of, all of the Maori representation within Rurangi. It's about letting go of the need to control uh, so that's where, you know, our trans, uh, consultation panel with the power of veto came in, you know, and, and what's, you know, what we spoke about from the very start was, you know, there's no risk in that. Like, where is the risk of giving a panel of trans consultants veto power on a production at, at five or six places for anything that's problematic? Like there is no risk because 
our audience was trans, right? So like, it's essentially giving power to the audience, if you think about it. Craig and Cole's sort of legacies for the industry was a role that they created, which is, I mean, I think in a small way, this perhaps kind of encapsulates, you know, um, Craig's uh, uh, relationship with the idea of ethical producing, like the, the kindness officer, right? That was actually a role on set. And I know there's been conversations about other productions adopting that. So maybe, I don't know, Craig, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Cause I, I think that was a stroke of genius. Yeah, well, I mean, Cole, Cole and I, this sort of came out of our conversations around how to actually, you know, support and protect our trans talent when they're on set. And that's kind of where it originated, you know, because it's one thing casting um, trans people in all the trans roles, but your responsibility doesn't stop there. That's where it starts. Uh, and the responsibility then goes on to how do you support your trans talent, all your trans interns, uh, on set in terms of educating the cisgender crew around uh, s simple things like misgendering, um, you know, creating safe environments where uh, talent don't feel like they're going to be, you know, accidentally, you know, touched inappropriately by say the wardrobe department. Uh, all of these need to be considered. And so as part of that, uh, along with training for, for all of our crew uh, around uh, um, gender and sexual diversity and, and, um, uh, and a whole lot of like uh, communication because <laughs> that's what it comes down to really. Uh, along with all of that, we created this role of the kindness officer uh, as a person that people could go and speak to if about anything, right? Like it was, it was somebody that they could speak to confidential, confidentially, um, somebody that would, you know, listen. And if need be somebody that had the power to raise conversations and deal with them uh, at a producerial level. When I've been asked about this, um, or when I speak about it, it feels kind of like common sense. And yet at the same time, it's like, well, it's not actually very common. And, and people are like, wow, tell us more about this thing. Um, but, you know, things, issues that were raised with me or things that I dealt with where all this person needed was someone to hear them or someone to vent to someone to listen that it wasn't going to like get back to anyone else or cause some kind of you know interpersonal conflict or something like that or that they needed someone to you know on their behalf anonymously go and action something um but yeah the things that i dealt with that you know at this point was really like low input needed for these people. They just needed someone to hear them. It's really lovely for a, a cast and crew of people to know that there's someone there that's got their back, you know, and is going to listen at any point. Even if you take that part away and you think about it for purely financially, um, you know, it made a huge amount of sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have to applaud you all. I mean, these are the kinds of changes that we want industry-wide, and it can seem like a small thing just to have someone there to hear you, but it's a huge thing, really, and it's what hasn't been there structurally since the beginning yeah. of the industry, really. So uh, really applause to you all for creating that space for people. I mean, something else that I kind of wanted to raise, because I did a thing recently and I forgot to mention, but it's really important, is there's a growing kind of thing about intimacy officers, and that's, like, amazing. But actually thinking about what trans um, actors need and then going, actually, everyone really needs that. You know, like, they were discussions with max you know and and then max with the actors and stuff about letting them know that they were in charge of their bodies and they made choices about what happened to their bodies um and that they had spaces to raise that um you know because it's like especially for trans people you know there are there are body parts or there are types of touch which are either uncomfortable or traumatic. Um, but actually that doesn't just apply to trans people. That mm. can apply to everyone. And everyone should have the right to be able to say, actually, 
no, I don't want that to happen. You know, it, it, there's this idea that actors are somehow this blank slate that you just kind of like, you know, they're flesh puppets that you just kind of move around and tell them to do this and they do that or whatever like that. And it shouldn't be the case. It should be, it should be a case of, you know, an actor going, actually, no, I don't want that. You know, how can we work to achieve the same end for what you need as a director or what you need as a writer, you know, while still respecting my bodily autonomy. Yeah, that's 100% like right, you know, so it's promoting those values. But alongside that, you know, the experiences that, um, are, you know, our trans, trans community um, have a lot of what we need to do to put, in, you know, like to create a safe space, it's, it's not... Uh, it's, it's not only the trans community that needs that it's everyone. There's just different levels of acceptance. And I think a lot of what we struggle with is this idea that we're all professional robots. Um, yeah. we're, we're all human and like creating a safe space for trans people actually creates a safe space for everyone. And it's mm -hmm. this intersectionality that we need to kind of like, um, start to like respect, you know, in terms of, like j just look at the film industry at the moment when it comes to like work hours and uh, fatigue and stress and like all of these things, you know, like it's not an ethical way to work. Um, mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we need to look at like how we can support people from a mental health perspective uh, from a, you know, you know, and just start to treat humans more like humans. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And the thing is, is it's, it makes so much sense on so many levels because you create an environment where people feel safe and respected and like, you know, their individual needs and their individual, um, their individuality is, is seen and respected. Then people feel like they can give their all or it removes that whole anxiety about, you know, are my boundaries going to, be be encroached upon or whatever like that that stops people from from giving their all or from doing their best work or things like that um yeah so you you, you get better you get better stuff especially how the u.s industry seemed to have operated was with hierarchies and ruling by fear and and <laughs> intensity and it's it's amazing to hear that this is how you're you're looking to make sets operate and it clearly is proof from the series that good work comes from that. Um, mm. We're just about wrapping up, but I wanna ask, um, I know we all have hopes for season two. I don't know if season two is green light yet, but if everybody has one thing that they would hope for in a season two, what would that be? And I'll start with Max. So um, for season two, one of the one of my great hopes is something that we're we're already pulling together, um, which is a writers' table. Uh, the resources for season one were so negligible that really our writers' table was Cole with some sort of support from from me, um, and you know Rurangi is so intersectional and and covers you know so many different experiences, and we really want to make sure that they're at the writers' table, and um, so you know and especially the Māori voices. So that's something I'm super excited about, um, and just yeah, crossing my my fingers for that. And um, I I can't wait to see the intimate relationship between. Uh, Kaz and Jim. I like, I just think that's going to be so fascinating. And, and Cole's kind of charted a whole arc for that through season two. So those are, those are my big, big things. Yeah. That's also got the ship name already as well. Like, you know, Jim and Kaz is jazz, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. you know, hashtag, hashtag <laughs> throw that out there. Els, how about you? You have any hope, uh, fingers crossed? Do you already know what's going to happen? You just can't tell us. I was going to say, I hope I'm just cast, but we've come <laughs> down. So we're good. Um, I, I really, I really hope that we, we get to explore more of the Maori stuff because, you know, I, I may not have um, grown up um, feeling like I was a part of, you know, the trans community or LGBTQI community, but something that is really close to my heart and what I'm very familiar with is being indigenous and Maori and, and then the culture and all that, you know, cause I grew up um, speaking the language and mum threw me into it. Like 
completely. And and I really want to, yeah, I really want that for all my people. I want to I wanna know more about that shame behind not knowing the language and not knowing where you're from. And because, you know, I felt that growing up as well. Um, so, yeah, that's what I hope for um, and other things. But, yeah, that's, that's the main one is, is, is really just bringing it back to, to my people at home. Um, yeah. Very cool. Um, just before we end, uh, a little fun thing. I mean, I think the influence of Orangi has opened some opportunities. And, you know, Val Fronts is about queer television, and we actually have a Drag Race panel, but some of you <laughs> are on Drag Race Down Under. I believe as we tape this, Els is going to be a guest judge. And Max, you're, you're a pit crew daddy, right? Um, how did yeah. Orangi open that door? Like, how did that opportunity come about for both of you? I saw. I don't know if something went terribly wrong or terribly right that the the director of Rurangi ended up dancing around the set of RuPaul's Drag Race down under in his underwear, and and us our young star gets to be on the judges panel. So I, I was. I don't know. Have you got any theories about how that happened? How could that ever be wrong? <laughs> it's, so, it's so strange. I'm just glad I didn't have to run around in my undies because that wouldn't have been. A good <laughs> uh, it's the world's loss, Al. It's the world's loss. I oh, know. Um, I think when RuPaul's concerned, uh, magic and miracles uh, just happen. And um, in a weird way, it was the pandemic that made that possible because the show, I mean, and this is common knowledge, um, it was meant to be shot in Sydney and at the last minute, um, due to concerns about COVID, they um, just sort of jumped the puddle and set up shop in Auckland. And so, and you know, the rest is history. But um, yeah, definitely looking forward to seeing the next episode tonight. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for, for joining us for this talk. I'm, again, very excited for the U.S. to experience this series. Um, again, it is exclusively on Hulu in the U.S. on June 14th, but... Out front people, you get three episodes in advance uh, as of June 8th, so or June 7th, excuse me. So tune in if you haven't already. Thank you uh, all. And let us know what you think. Yeah, please. Uh, I know Max and Els are on Instagram. You can DM them <laughs> your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. But uh, thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, Mike. You.